What happens when one man tries to watch all of the horror films of the 1980s entirely by himself? Um, we're about to find out, because I'm your host, Josh Spiegel, and this is The 80s Project. Welcome back to The 80s Project, where we're going through all of the horror films of the 1980s, month by month, day by day. On the last episode, we kicked off the year 1980, jump-starting the decade, but the greatest horrors are still to come. Join me now as we journey back to the decade that, yeah, okay, most people remember for some fairly silly fashion, but we all remember for the practical effects. We pick back up with Zombie Holocaust, which premiered in Italy on March 28th, which was directed by Marino Girolami, a long-established Italian director who had been making films since 1950. And this was in fact one of his last movies. It's the tale of a New York hospital which has some corpses showing up, missing some body parts, and it seems like it's this guy who has a superpower to transform into a dummy and then back again. Ian McCullough, who had literally just done Zombie 2, shows up here as well, and there's killings in which this mark keeps showing up, which they trace back to an island, which seems to be McCullough's whole thing. I mean, that's pretty much the plot of zombie and they're even going there to track down a doctor that's involved in ghoulish stuff they meet the good doc and jesus lucas is even here and it was even filmed on the same damn sets because they really weren't trying to win any points for originality with this one so if this one seems familiar it might be because you know it from a different title because it wasn't released in America until 1982 and it came out over here as Dr. Butcher, MD, which is at least a more original title, but the version released here was pretty heavily edited down and even featured an opening scene from an entirely different unfinished movie. It's weird because the first third of this is pretty much zombie, but then it basically becomes Cannibal Holocaust for the middle. But then it's like, it, it remembers, hey, we're supposed to be ripping off Fulci here, better get back to that. The film did okay when it was released, but never really got the notoriety of the films that it's the most similar to. Although some of the practical effects have earned it a nice little place in gore history. My rating on this one is two and a half beta tapes because although it's nowhere near a zombies level, it's still pretty entertaining and those effects are great. The horror cultural significance is pretty low at a two though since it doesn't really do like anything new at all. Should you watch it? Yep, especially if you like fun classic Italian zombie movies. The patient screamed, disturbing me, performed removal of vocal cords. We next head to a different part of the world with the release of We're Going to Eat You on April 2nd, at least in Hong Kong. This one was directed by the legendary Choi Hark, who was all over the scene back then, making a name as both a director and a writer, winning tons of awards, and became known as the Steven Spielberg of Asia. He'd even later go on to make a couple of American films with Jean-Claude Van Damme, which was apparently some sort of requirement for Hong Kong directors. This one has a whole village of cannibals that prey on tourists, and there's a secret agent that's after a villain named Rolex, although he's not much of a secret agent since he tells the first guy he encounters what he's there to do. It has all the hallmarks of the kung fu movies of that era, but it has a bit more gore than those do, and has the standards of Hark's work, which gives it a healthy dose of comedy in there as well. Because of budgetary reasons, it lifts a good deal of its soundtrack straight from Suspiria. Which certainly adds an interesting contrast to the on-screen antics. This wasn't that successful overseas, and Choi in fact had two movies come out in that same year. The other was a crime thriller called Dangerous Encounters of the First Kind, 
which actually became a big box office success, totally overshadowing this one. Hark himself isn't too proud of the work, claiming that it didn't turn out good, although it definitely still has a fan base because of its odd mixture of genres and screwball characters. My rating is actually a two and a half because it's still pretty fun, even though it's kinda typical stuff, but it is interesting to see your standard martial arts film with a handful of gross out moments. The HCS is pretty low though at two tapes since it just didn't have a big impact on the genre. And should you watch it? Uh, if, you, if you like old kung fu movies, you should. If you grew up on Saturday morning kung fu theater, it's a fun flashback with a horror flair. <laughs> a little further into April, on the 9th, we get our next entry with Don't Go In The House. It was written and directed by Joseph Ellison and was his first feature. And he would go on to make only one other film and that was a musical comedy called Joey. It's got Donnie here who has an obsession with fire and he's played by Dan Grimaldi who went on to do a series of bit parts until landing a pretty solid run on The Sopranos playing Patsy Parisi. When he finds his mother dead and he commences a Bates style meltdown, eventually kidnapping someone, stripping her naked, covering her in gas and burning her alive with a flamethrower. It's the scene that is off-sighted when talking about the film and its excessiveness, and he continues his spree seeking out pretty women with long blonde hair, and he's haunted by the ghost of his mother. The film actually got some fairly positive reviews, but was pretty strongly criticized for its depictions of violence, although to be fair, it's almost entirely condensed into that one brutal scene. Although audiences were torn between lauding its character depth and interesting portrayal of the repercussions of abuse and tearing down its grimness and overall seedy vibes. The backlash for the violence was so strong that it made Ellison step back from filmmaking and he didn't make another movie for six years with Joey and when that film failed to garner the acclaim that his earlier film received minus the outrage that it also caused, he retired from filmmaking. Interesting to note that the ending, which is pretty great, would be repeated pretty closely the following year with Maniac. I'm giving this one a solid three because it is a deeper and richer film than I would have expected, but it's also a bit tedious and doesn't really have much new to say. Its significance is at a two since it just didn't blaze any new ground and uh, sorry about the fire pun, but it was fairly typical even if it was well done. So, should you watch it? Yeah, definitely, it's a pretty solid flick, even if it's not gonna show you something that you haven't seen before. A little while later, on April 17th, we have an unusual entry with Watcher in the Woods. And oh yes, that says Walt Disney. This was a Walt Disney production, and the story with this one is crazy. It was directed by John Hoff, who had done a number of Disney productions, including the Witch Mountain movies, which I would love to do a timeline on at some point. But he also made the weird sci-fi action flick, Biggles Adventure in Time, which I just love. And have other people seen this movie? And The Howling Part 4. It stars Betty Davis's eyes and, oh, oh yeah, the, the, the whole rest of her too, and Lindsay Wallace and the Queen of the Ice Castles. And that reference is basically just for my sister. After this family move into a big gothic mansion and there's tension right away, including their creepy guest house resident, and then there's something in the woods watching. It's right there in the title. Soon there's optical effects in the forest and the revelation that young Jan is the spinning image of Mrs. Aylwood's daughter that disappeared years ago. There's then a series of life endangering accidents as it seems that someone has it out for the kids and a series of beautiful set pieces as they try to find out just what happened to Karen. It gets pretty wild and eventually involves eclipses and interdimensional beings, but it's not nearly as wild as the behind the scenes. 
First of all, the ending was completely reshot since it originally featured an appearance by the Watcher itself and was a giant bug looking thing that's both a pretty cool practical effect as well as being um, something that appears to have wandered in from a different movie. Like it was this slow burn haunted house kind of movie and then suddenly they're, they're being transported to Krypton? or something, it's a really weird tonal shift, and here's where it gets wild. They released the film incomplete. The effects weren't done, so they had to make a second since it was rushed out in order to coincide with Betty Davis's 50th anniversary as an actor, missing the entire interdimensional stuff. So it was just Jan disappearing and then reappearing later with Karen, so it made very little sense. Because of this, the film had a huge backlash with critics tearing it apart and audiences being very upset over being shown an unfinished film. Disney ended up pulling the film from theaters after 10 days and replaced it with a re-release of Mary Poppins. They then went back and reshot the ending, now with young Ellie basically walking in and explaining what was going on to make it more coherent and eliminating the alien and the other world. But the only thing was that they did it without Hoff and brought in an uncredited Vincent McAvity to shoot the ending and an alternate intro. Davis wasn't available as well, so they had to reshoot her scenes apart from everyone else, which is why she doesn't interact with anyone. Because of this, the film petered out at the box office. It made $40,000 in its first 10-day run, and when it was re-released a year later in 81 with the new ending, it managed a mere $5 million on a $9 million budget. Over time, though, it's garnered a cult following and even had a remake in 2017 with Angelica Houston that was directed by Melissa Joan Hart. My rating here is a 3. It's pretty enjoyable and really pretty to look at, but it's a little empty, and even the toned down finale still feels a little out of place. Its cultural significance is at a 2 since it's not really extremely groundbreaking, but the backstory of the film has helped it stand out more but it's lessened by never really deciding if it wants to be a horror film or not. Should you watch it? Oh, hell yeah, it's not great. But it's kind of fun to see Disney, with a solid budget, trying their hand at something a little more adult-oriented in that era. But where is Karen? On that same date in Italy, Lamberto Bava's Macabre was released, although it didn't get an American theatrical run until 1983, and this was one of Bava's first films before he would go on to make the Demons series. It's set in New Orleans, and Jane here is cheating on her husband, so her daughter drowns her brother in the tub. I mean, kid, kids would be kids, right? But then, on the way home, her lover is railed. A year later, she's left her husband and moved into dead Fred's place. So like between the beginning of the movie and this, just know that Jane does not make good choices. She makes a shrine to her guy, getting a little crazy pants, and things get uncomfortable with Fred's blind son who lives there as well. Then commences a wild game of cat and mouse between Jane, Robert, Jane's daughter, and um, uh, let, let's just say that this one gives a new perspective on the phrase, giving head. When it was released here in the States, it was given the title Frozen Terror and only a limited release and was a moderate success in its home country. Critically, it did pretty well with most complimenting its visual styling and quirky tone. It's definitely a slow burn though, and certainly not the most action packed of films and only shows a percentage of the insanity that would soon be evident in Baba's more well-known films. But it was clear that he learned well from his father, Mario Baba, who was often called the master of Italian horror. Although Lamberto never quite lived up to that, this film is a good indicator that the apple, or in this case, I guess meatball or whatever Italian metaphor I'm trying to make here, didn't fall far from the tree. And meatballs aren't in trees. I don't know, this one got away away from me. My rating here is two and a half tapes because although it's nice to look at, it's 
a bit of a drag and doesn't quite have the payoff that you would hope. Its HCS is the same since it's the launching point for Lumberto, although it doesn't quite go higher since it's not really what made him a brand name. Should you watch it? Yes, you should. It, it's cool to see the starting point for Bava's style, and it's a weird, sick little flick. Then on May 8th, our next entry actually showed up on television with The Curse of King Tut's Tomb. It aired on NBC, directed by longtime TV director Philip Laycock, when an archaeological dig uncovers the seal of Necropolis, he takes it to an old acquaintance. Raymond Burr shows up, and I think that he's supposed to be Indian here? Like, they've darkened his skin a bit and gave him a headdress? But at least he doesn't attempt an accent. They discover the lost tomb of Tutankhamen, and of course there's a curse involved because, yep, it's in the title. But then, Tom Baker shows up. Yes, Tom Baker appears as an Indian man in brown face named Hassan. According to Baker, he shot quite a bit more footage and a great deal of his role was cut. And yeah, maybe that was a good idea. They're besieged by an earthquake, and apparently Ian McShane was hired to play the main character of Carter here, but right before filming, was in a car wreck and broke his leg, causing them to replace him with Robin Ellis. And man, is, is this one slow. Even for a TV movie, it's a bit of a drag, with everything taking forever to happen. Plus, if you're holding out hopes for some classic mummy action, you're gonna be disappointed. It's called The Curse of King Tut's Tomb, not The Mummy Who Lives There. What's my rating? It's just one and a half stars because honestly, there's just nothing to it. And its significance, not much higher. It doesn't really add anything new, do anything new, or well, much of anything really at all. So it gets a one there. Should you watch it? Only if you're a Tom Baker completionist. My name is Hassan. Sir, I wish to be your new number one. May 9th was a busy day for horror with our first theatrical release being Beyond Evil. This one was directed by Herb Freed, who directed a handful of films with Graduation Day being probably his most prominent one. And we get newlyweds Linda Day, George from Pieces, and Nancy's dad, who are moving to the Philippines. But when their place isn't quite ready yet, they have to stay in the Casa Fortuna, an old mansion that, guess what, is reported to be haunted. Of course, its previous inhabitants were a witch and her husband who killed each other, but Alma's spirit still lurks and she has green spooky eyes. She starts to hold sway over Barbara and begins doing evil deeds like running this car off the road and making it explode in midair instead of when it crashes, like, like what? happens here. There's crane accidents, balcony accidents, and oh boy, this one is also pretty damn slow. But with all the possession stuff and the accidents, it, it feels like they're going for an omen ripoff, but it never really comes together. But there are some pretty awesome optical effects going on, like kryptonite eye beams. It didn't really get a substantial theatrical run, only playing for three days at only 56 theaters, pulling in around $250,000. It didn't really leave a big mark during release and has sort of been forgotten over time, save for a rare leading man role for Saxon. My rating on this one is one and a half because it's fairly uneventful, save for a few campy moments. And its horror significance is also low, not really offering anything new or suspenseful or impactful. So it's also a one and a half, and the half is for Nancy's dad. Should you watch it? I suppose if you're having some trouble getting to sleep? Bob, you, me, this whole thing. Uh, why don't we forget it all, huh? What do you say? Yeah! On that same day in West Germany, Contamination was released, although it wouldn't get a US release until a year later in 1981. 
This one was directed by Luigi Cozzi, who was responsible for that 1977 Italian version of Godzilla. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I highly recommend seeking it out because as confused as you are right now, that is nothing compared to how confused you're going to be after you see it. This one's a weird cross between a horror film, a sci-fi flick, and a spy thriller as a team exploring a ship that drifted into New York Harbor encounters a batch of weird eggs that, when exploded, caused the people nearby to explode from within. And you know, if I had a nickel for every Italian horror film from 1980 that begins with a ghost ship drifting into New York Harbor, well, I mean, I only have two nickels, but it's still weird that it happens twice. It was made in the wake of Alien, and the intention was to make something similar, but on Earth. But with the eggs and a big alien. This one was another one that caught the attention of the whole video nasty phenomenon and wasn't available for a while in the UK. Meanwhile, in the US, in order to cash on in its similarities to Alien, it was released as Alien Contamination and apparently also Toxic Spawn. And apparently the original shooting title was Alien Arrives on Earth. Gotzi wanted to use several actors from Zombie 2, but ultimately only featured Ian McCullough as an astronaut who went to Mars in some very familiar looking shots. And this one will also be notable to me as being the film I saw when I was really young, but never really knew what it was. And I'd only ever seen this one scene of a giant alien eating a person through some sort of elephant trunk looking thing. I didn't know what the movie was, but seeing it was fairly traumatic. And it wasn't until much, much later that I finally saw the film and I just completely lit up when I realized I was finally solving a mystery of what that film was. This did fairly well, but didn't really set the scene on fire, but is fairly well remembered. And my rating is a solid three because it is a fun, entertaining, yet very tonally confusing little movie that's a bit of a mess. Its HCS is a two and a half because it's more known as a ripoff than anything else, but has some video nasty cred and that kick-ass goblin score. Should you watch it? Yes, you definitely should. You should see what traumatized me as a child. Then, of course, on May 9th, another movie came out that changed the whole direction of the decade, and it was Friday the 13th. Directed by Sean S. Cunningham, the film was an attempt to capitalize on the success of John Carpenter's Halloween, but instead of an unseen stalker coming after suburban teenage babysitters, instead, the location was moved to a summer camp as an unseen stalker comes after rural teenage camp counselors. It dips into the tropes that had already been established for the genre so far with POV shots of the killer and a majority of murders happening immediately after the victims have had sex. It featured a starring role for a then unknown Kevin Bacon maxing out that blue speedo there and featured some of the earlier work of special effects legend Tom Savini. Contrary to popular opinion, uh, to the point that it was a featured bit of dialogue in the movie Scream, the killer of the movie was not Jason and was in fact his mother, Pamela Voorhees. Jason isn't even really in the movie unless you count the stinger at the end, which wasn't even a part of the script and the film as originally written didn't contain Jason at all and simply ended with Alice on the lake. The introduction of the deformed child Jason was a decision made on set, with some accounts saying it was Savini's idea, although it's apparently been disputed. The role of Pamela was filled by the only recognizable name at the time, Betsy Palmer, who at that point was mostly known for wholesome, motherly roles. The success of the film had a big impact on her career, one that she greatly resented at first, but grew to embrace before her passing in 2015. Friday was actually an independent film, but was picked up for distribution pretty quickly by Paramount after a bidding war for the film between them, Warner Brothers, and United Artists, which kind of makes me wonder what the franchise would have looked like if one of those other studios had won. 
It went on to be hugely successful, of course, bringing in $60 million worldwide, which was a pretty big feat at that point for a horror film, and an international release was pretty unusual for an independent film. At the time, it was, well, not well regarded. Uh, critics crapped on it, even though they liked the performances, loved that score with its standout cha 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 ah, 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 but otherwise disregarded it as violent trash. Obviously, other films like Halloween came first and popularized slasher films, but film scholars have often pegged Friday as really boosting the genre into the cultural mainstream and influencing dozens and dozens of imitators. My rating of this one is a 4, I can't rate it lower because it's set the bar and established the franchise, but I'll admit that it's not my favorite F-13 film, nor is it the best. Y you've gotta love it though, it's horror cultural significance is a straight up 5, it's one of the biggest in the game and paved the way for so many others that followed. There's no way that this isn't one of the 5s. And finally, should you watch it? Um, you already did. I doubt you'd be watching this if you haven't. But if by chance you have not seen this one, you should. Like, tonight. Then he's still there. So there you have it, the second round of films from the year 1980. My personal favorite from that lineup is obviously Friday the 13th, which I know is probably pretty pretty obvious but to be honest but it, it's clearly the best of this bunch since this month and a half or so of 80 was a little rough yeah um if you want to let me know your favorite you can send it to me at the movie timelines guy at gmail.com also let me know if there's one that i missed or what your personal tape rating that would be and we'll see you on the next episode for more of the 80s project Thank you.